Some bugs are straight up unforgivable. Now, before we start, I understand this video is gonna get no views because I'm wearing a collared shirt and apparently like Gen Z hates collars. But in this video, I wanna talk about a vulnerability in the D-Link NAS, a network attached storage that is so egregious that I'm not sure how a company like this is not held legally responsible for this vulnerability. In this video, we're talking about the bug. We're gonna break it down in Ghidra. We're gonna find the vulnerability. Now, if you're new here, hi, my name is Ed. This is Low Level TV, a channel where I talk about cybersecurity, software security, a bunch of other cool stuff. So if you like this stuff or just wanna hang out with me, hit that sub button, I really appreciate it. Today, attackers now target a critical severity vulnerability with publicly available exploit code that affects multiple models of end of life D-Link network attached storage devices tracked as CVE 2024-10914. The command injection vulnerability allows sending shell commands arbitrarily by sending a malicious HTTP GET request to vulnerable devices exposed online. And and not only that, it, oh, it gets better. Hold on. The attack started after D-Link stated on Friday that it wouldn't be fixing the security flaw because it only impacts end of life NAS models, warning customers to retire affected devices or upgrade them to newer products. So what that means in layman's terms is, hey, our code is so bad and so old that now it's your problem if you get hacked because we don't wanna deal with it. Cause who determines the end of life timeline for a product? Oh yeah, it's the manufacturer, okay? So what this means is that D-Link is putting it on the consumer to buy another NAS that definitely doesn't have other vulnerabilities in it because fuck you. Um, it's absolutely insane to me. So I wanna talk a little bit about this bug again, 2024-10914, found by this guy named NetSecFish, props to him. Now what you're probably thinking is like, oh my God, arbitrary command injection, that has to be some kind of crazy vulnerability that exploits a buffer overflow and you use that to wrap around. You call mProtect and that D mProtects the page and you can use that to run shellcode. Nope, it's this, it's this, it's this. A single curl command to the target IP with the command CGI add username. Oh, look at that. And you just kinda you just kinda put your shell command in the command and it echoes it. And the, the command here is them showing over TCP in Wireshark. Uh, if they inject the command echo some base64 base string, out comes the base64 string. This means that it is running the command via a command injection. And, and that's it. And so this guy found the bug, you know, he reported it to D-Link, they told him to fuck off. And the recommendation is apply available patches and updates from the manufacturer. Oh wait, there aren't any because D-Link gave up. And then uh, to just, I guess, not use the IP addresses. Now, obviously like you shouldn't have your NAS with like its butt and the ethernet port like facing out to the internet. So like if you're doing that already, shame on you, I guess. But also um, the fact that there isn't a simple patch for this is kind of crazy. When I was preparing to make this video, um, I did some initial reverse engineering on this. I wanted to look at the bug and to just kind of be able to show in the binary where the bug was happening. And this bug is so silly. I cannot even describe to you how silly it is. I have to show it to you and you may pee your pants. Let's go. I personally believe that in a world where JavaScript and TypeScript and Python, these higher level languages are becoming more and more popular, it is becoming more and more important to understand the fundamentals of computers. On my site, The Level Academy, I have courses that will teach you just that. In my course, Zero to Hero C Programming, I'll teach you how to code in the C programming language. We'll build a nice little project to get your hands dirty. I'll teach you how network code works and we'll build on that and get into threads. And even if you wanna get even crazier, I'll teach you how to code in assembly. You can go right now and take my load operations lesson, learn how the load instruction works in ARM assembly, or even try a lesson on arrays for free right now. The courses are on sale, get them while the sale is still going on. You can't be a good coder without knowing the fundamentals and where do you learn the fundamentals on low level academy. Back to the video. Okay, so we're in my, my hacking environment here. For those of you that ask, I use um, Ubuntu 2204 uh, long-term service and I'm using oh my ZSH with ZSH shell, power level 10K, all those upgrades to make my shell look nice and pretty. Um, so I was able to download the firmware for one of the affected models here. This is the DNS340L. You'll see it has a compile date in 2018 and there are no additional firmware downloads. So that means that like this is the last firmware you can get and this one is vulnerable to the attack. So to triage this, we have to do a few things. When you 
download the firmware, you actually get it in this zip file. Unzip this zip file. That will eventually yield this binary file. And if we type file on this, we'll see that it's just data. Okay, so what do we do with data? Well, a lot of the times, if the firmware isn't encrypted, which is what happens for a lot of these device manufacturers, we can do this thing called uh, binwalk. What binwalk does is it recursively, that's what the capital M does for Mastroika dolls. It uh, walks through the firmware image. It finds a known file type that is uncompressible, and then it goes into that and runs the same pro program recursively. Uh, and by doing that, we're able to find this thing called a squash FS file system. The squash FS file system is going to be where all of the code on the device lives, right? You'll see this is literally just the root file system that would be on the D-Link NAS. If you're a bug bounty hunter, for example, if you wanna find vulnerabilities and fix things in software, for embedded devices, this is how you start 99% of the projects, right? You go and you get the firmware, you run bin walk, and out will pop out either a SquashFS file system, which is a uh, runtime compressed and read only file system, or a JFF2, JFFS2 file system, which is a journaled flash file system version two. Uh, and you can use those now on your disk to look at the binaries. Now, as we saw in the article before, we know the vulnerability is hiding out in this account manager.cgi script. So let's let's find out if we can let's see if we can find where this account manager CGI script runs. Now, luckily, we can go to uh, CD CGI and LS, and wow, look, literally the first thing that is there is that file. What I think literally happened when this guy was doing this research is he wanted to find bugs in this thing. And I think what he probably did is he opened the first CGI file and like found a bug immediately because of how bad this code is. Let's go into it and show you how bad the code is. If you know anything about CGI, typically CGI takes two forms. Either it is a bash script that runs when you give it CGI params or it is an ELF that runs, an executable linkable format file like in Linux that runs uh, when you give it commands, right? So if I go to the slash CGI bin slash account manager dot CGI path, it'll run the associated program. So that here is gonna be account manager dot CGI. Now I've loaded this up into Ghidra here. Ghidra, if you don't know, is the reverse engineering framework that was produced by the NSA. It's really, really good. I like it. They also have dark mode, which is super awesome. Uh, but you'll see here, we have this thing called the CGI main function. The CGI main function, as it kind of implies, is the main function that gets ran whenever you call this CGI binary. And what it does is it extracts the name of the, the parameter that you wanna run and puts it into the stir compare operation. And so we know the vulnerability from before comes from the, what is it? The CGI user add function. So we're just gonna go into the function that gets called if the stir compare returns zero, which is going to be this function here, the one that handles adding the user. So when I was preparing this video, I, I opened this and immediately I saw this safe system function. And so if you've ever done uh, programming or you, you've, you've, you've used C before, you know that the system function on its own is very, very easy to get wrong. If you don't know how to program, I can talk about it real quick. The, the system function is literally how can you in C run a shell command? So if I, for example, wanted to have my program echo uh, hello, right? Hello would print nothing, but if I say hello equals one, and I say echo hello, I, it, it echoes one, I can run all these commands in C by simply doing the system command. Now, the reason there are vulnerabilities in this command is if I were able to say, for example, that hello is equal to bin ls, and then I say echo, and then echo the contents of hello, this will actually run the command inside of it. This, this whole thing is known as a command injection, where basically if you're able to control the contents of a system command, you can put malicious stuff in there. Okay, so how do we get around this? Well, D-Link actually initially, and this is where it starts to get really funny, they, they wrote this wrapper called safe system. And so I, I dove deep into safe system. I'm like, okay, so they call account, which is probably a program that adds an account. Okay, and so they get this U from, oh, the name variable is probably the username. Oh, they get this P flag from the password variable. Oh, probably the password for the account. And then I, okay, so maybe there's a vulnerability in safe system. So you'll actually see that safe system is imported from this lib safe system.so binary. Okay, okay, okay. So let's see what safe system does. Um, let's see, it parses 
some string, it's iterating over some set of strings, and then it passes that into safe exec. Oh, interesting. Okay, so how does exec work? Well, safe exec, what it does is it sets up a bunch of these sig actions that handle diff different signals in the program, right? Don't worry about that. what that means. But at the end of the day, what it does is it forks, which means it makes a new process. And eventually, it calls this function exec cvp or exec vp. Now, exec vp is actually much, much safer than system. The reason being, when you run the system command, a system command is just saying exec the command in a shell which means that all of the command substitution things like this, for example, will actually get interpreted. If I were to instead do exec VP, I don't have the command substitutions. I'm not running it in a shell. I'm just doing a direct syscall to the operating system. So when I was reading this code, I was like, man, what, what could they possibly be doing wrong that enables a command injection? This is actually the canonically correct way to write code that doesn't have a command injection. What is happening here? So I go back, I go look at the path, and I'm like, okay, so what? They're, they're calling safe system, that calls exec. What are they calling safe system on? Account, oh, okay, so they, they wrote another program to create accounts. Okay, okay, let's go into account and see what's going on in account. And, and so, it, it, do, you see, do you see this? Do you see what's happening? In the account program that they wrote, that they call with safe system, they not only use sprintf, which is a vulnerable function that enables stack overflows onto the stack, but then they call not safe system, they call system. So what does that mean? You can arbitrarily include commands in your username and it will get ran as system despite the fact that they put it into safe system. I, I, like you can't make this stuff up, dude. They wrote an entire function to prevent this from happening. And then the program that they call with this other program has the vulnerability they were trying to avoid. It, it is truly a vulnerability of the times. I just, it's, I, I, I don't know what to make out of this. The, the whole point of this video is that some bugs are acceptable. Some bugs are understandable. A time of check, time of use vulnerability that enables a use after free or a race condition. Um, a buffer overflow where like you do a minus one and you wrap around the length value and you get this max int copy. Okay, okay, you missed that. But bro, like look at this shit. It's a percent S into a sprintf into a system, man. How, how is nobody held accountable? I don't get it. It's crazy to me. Anyway, if you want to go poke around at this, I'm going to leave a link to the firmware in the description below. If you think these videos are good, if you enjoyed this, if you think I'm stupid, any one of them, hit subscribe. I appreciate it. And then go check out this video where I did something actually very similar for a different IoT device. Um, we'll see you there. Thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate it.